Hey everybody, welcome back, Alex here. Now by now you've probably heard how the M1 Pro is for professionals and the M1 Max is for more professional professionals or some variation of that BS. Now I wanna give you a more concrete path in this video if you're a software developer. If you're not a software developer, there's a ton of other videos on YouTube, but you can stick around if you wanna see my perspective. Warning, the following is my opinion and you may or may not agree with me, and that's okay. What I'm trying to say is that even if you are a software developer, you might still disagree with my list. So let's march on. What I've got on the screen is a little table I've created with the new M1 chips on the bottom along the X axis. Yes, we've got the M1, we've got the M1 Pro and the M1 Max. And notice that Intel is there also. Why the heck is Intel there? Well, you'll see. Basically, Apple Silicon is not quite ready for all the developer workflows. So I put that in there because, well, you might wanna get an Intel Mac or you might wanna just get a PC machine to do your work if you're one of those kinds of developers. But I'll get into that in a moment. You'll also notice that I did not break this down by the machine type. So for example, oh, this is a MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro chip with 16 gigs of RAM and 16 cores of GPU. I didn't do that because these chips are gonna scale to whatever you need. So for example, you can get the different configurations that you might need. And I will actually take that into account and I'll mention it when I get to the different developer types. If a certain machine doesn't meet the spec, like the M1 for example, because it doesn't have enough RAM. All right, with that out of the way, let's get going. And sorry to those developers that I don't have on my list. First up, front end web developer. These are people that specialize in the development of the user interface and they have visual elements like layouts, aesthetics. They deal with cross-browser compatibility issues. So they deal with code that runs on different user devices, browsers, operating systems, and so on. Responsive web applications comes to mind here as well. A front-ender will use tools like uh, Angular or React or Vue as the framework or library to build your JavaScript front-ends. They could be pretty big applications. A lot of applications out there are pretty decently sized, but the nice thing about front-end web development is it's not super heavy. Heavy. Yes, I realize there are pretty large applications out there, mono repos with tons of apps being built, but most front end work is not like that. So these folks also deal with Node and NPM and increasingly workspace and code sharing mono repos like NX. So what needs to work fast here? CSS preprocessors, TypeScript compilation, bundling and minification, tools like Webpack and other bundlers. So for that, I'm gonna move this over here. Now I'm gonna skip over the Intel machine and we're gonna go right over to M1. And I think that's gonna be the minimum that you're gonna need. You could go with an M1 Pro or M1 Max, but I think that's unnecessary. And you can get away with all that work using a MacBook Air with 16 gigabytes of RAM. And that's the M1 MacBook Air from 2020. Very good machines for this purpose. And throughout all my testing on this channel, I've yet to find a case where you would need an Intel machine to do this work. Now, early on, there were some problems I ran into, for example, with some plugins that required native code to be built. And there were some compatibility issues there. But that's not the case anymore. Next up, backend. This is a software engineer who specializes in the underlying logic logic and performance of the application, and they often design and implement the core logic, keeping in mind scalability. And they do this by integrating with data systems, caches, email systems, they build APIs for the front end to talk to. And I'm also gonna include database engineers here as well, even though we know that sometimes these roles do very different things, but that's okay. Um, let's go ahead and move this over here. And this one is actually going to cover Intel as well. And I'm going to stretch this out a bit. We're going to cover M1 and we're going to cover M1 Pro here. So here's my reasoning behind this. We're going to have tools like PHP, .NET, Python, Node, Go. We're going to have databases like MySQL and SQL Server and Oracle and MongoDB. And that's all fine. However, you're going to run into cases where things might not work on the new Apple Silicon machines. Things like SQL Server, for example, and the whole .NET stack. Well, okay. I take that back. .NET now works on Apple Silicon, the cross-platform version of .NET, and that's awesome. If you haven't seen my video about that, check that out. However, if you need the full tooling, which is Visual Studio, Visual Studio proper, that is, not the Visual Studio for Mac, which I'm not gonna talk about that right now. Visual Studio 2022, not cross-platform, 
will not run on Apple Silicon, no matter what. Sorry, folks. Now, my SQL, I think there might be an ARM branch. I'm not 100% sure, but that's pretty new. Oracle, I don't think there's an ARM branch of that. Node works quite well, starting with Node 15, works very well on Apple Silicon. So there you go. And so does Go. There you go, Go. And Python works pretty well. So that's why we're covering this big range. Now, if I were to kind of rank these, I would say for most backend work, M1 MacBook Air would do just fine or MacBook Pro. So I'm going to put a one there as the one to go for. Then I'm going to put a two here on Intel because most commonly you're going to switch over to a Windows machine or an Intel based machine or an Intel based Mac. And in a rare instance, do you ever need M1 Pro based machine? Yeah, it's going to run things just a tad bit faster, but you're not getting that much benefit out of having that chip. So that's my ranking for the back end. And that, that explains the spread between those three types of processors. All right, next up, we've got full stack engineer. I mean, kind of sounds like what it is. Full stack is a software engineer who handles both front end and and back end work. These people are called full stack. They do the whole thing. They've got the skills required to create fully functional web applications and the tools that they use combine all the tools for the front end and back end. Now, if you're kind of new to this, you might have heard acronyms like MERN, MEAN, LAMP, ROAR. <laughs> <laughs> I find those kind of acronyms a little bit limiting because there's usually a ton more involved than the acronyms indicate. MERN stands for MongoDB as the database, Express as your backend, React and Node as your front end. Mean is basically the same thing, but instead of React, it's Angular. LAMP is Linux, Apache, oh, MySQL and uh, PHP. And ROR is uh, Ruby on Rails. All right, so let's not drag this out. Full stack is gonna have the same surface area on this chart as the biggest one, which is backend, but for the same exact reasons as backend. All right, we're leaving behind the web development for now, and we're gonna head over to mobile. A mobile engineer builds mobile applications using iOS and Android native stacks, or using hybrid frameworks like NativeScript, Flutter, React Native, Ionic. Yes, those frameworks also count because native text stack is constantly being used while developing in these ecosystems. So there are going to be some heavy resources that are needed running native simulators and emulators and sometimes native IDEs like Xcode and Android Studio. All those things take a lot of toll on your system. And that's going to reflect in the chart here. iOS and Android has slightly different tolerances here. For example, if you're doing purely iOS, I can move this over here to M1. Okay, the M1 Air will do if you're doing only iOS stuff because the increase in performance performance that we got going from Intel Max to the M1 Max in 2020. And yes, you do have to use a Mac for iOS development. The increase in performance was huge. Now the increase is even better, but it's not strictly necessary. However, if you are also doing Android development, and a lot of these things that I mentioned earlier are there, so you can do both iOS and Android, then I'm going to have to expand this a little bit. So Android works really well on Intel based machines. Okay, I'm going to have to expand it backwards a little bit to cover Intel. And it's starting to work well on Apple Silicon as well, but it's not quite 100% there yet. And you could get a lot more juice out of it if you forgo the x86 and x64 based JDKs and go for something that's native to Apple Silicon for your JDK. And I have some comparisons on this channel doing the builds with different JDKs. And it's a significant improvement if you're using an Apple Silicon based one. So. I'm going to cover Intel because you'll be able to do your Android development on Intel pretty well. Now, mind you, you have to get a Mac if you want to do iOS development. So Intel Mac will work for both very well. But since those machines are kind of fading out, you could save some money and get a MacBook Air to do your iOS stuff and then get a PC laptop for your Android stuff. So you'll have two machines, which is not a bad option, actually, because then you'll have a lot of versatility, but you're going to have to carry all that stuff around, which is sometimes a pain. So I'm going to stretch this out over here to M1 Max because it has double the bandwidth for memory, which is something that Android emulators are going to be pretty hungry for. But let's rank this one because going for the M1 Max is a little bit extravagant here. You don't really need it. So I'm going to rank it last. I'm going to go and put a four over here, a three over here for the M1 Pro, a one for the M1 and a two for the Intel machine. And as a side note, anytime I'm talking about the MacBook Air here, I'm talking about the 16 gigabyte model, not the eight gigabyte model, because that's just not going to be enough going forward. OK, want to clear that up right now. No eight gigabyte model for mobile. Absolutely not. 
Sorry, folks. Next up, we've got DevOps. These are the software engineers who are familiar with technologies required to do development, to deploy your applications, to do automated builds. They integrate and administer backend software and distributed systems. And they also manage application infrastructures, the database systems and servers. Your continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines are going to be configured, are usually going to be configured by DevOps engineers. So what do we need here for DevOps? I'm going to move this over and I'm going to start on Intel this time because there are just certain things that are going to be required, certain tools uh, that are not going to be working well yet with Apple Silicon. Here's an example. Okay, now if you've heard about Docker before and you've seen my videos on this channel, Docker actually supports and runs on Apple Silicon pretty well. And to understand why an Apple Silicon machine might not be the best choice for Docker, you kind of have to understand what Docker does. Docker basically virtualizes your applications and allows you to deploy lightweight images that run your application instead of a full virtual machine. So they're not virtualizing all the hardware, they're just virtualizing the software and the software stack that your application runs on. And because of that, if you're running on Apple Silicon, to get the best performance out of your applications during development time, you might have to use images that target ARM architectures. However, the availability of x64 based servers out there where you can uh, deploy your Docker containers, you're probably going to have much more x64 based targets out there than ARM based targets. And the whole idea of Docker is you're just basically creating your application and moving it from one place to another. But if you're going to use an ARM based image to create your application on, then moving that to an x64 based uh, server is not going to work. So while Docker runs pretty well on Apple Silicon, the underlying images might not during the entire life cycle of the image, not on your machine. So that's why I'm kind of putting this here under Intel first. Now, if your entire stack and your entire deployment pipeline is going to be ARM based, then of course, we can move this over a little bit and we can start moving it to the M1 territory and the M1 Pro territory. And that depends on what kind of application you're building. So if you are going to be building a front end application on Apple Silicon, you know what, it doesn't matter at that point, just get an M1 MacBook Air and you'll be fine. But if you're gonna have some back end tools, database tools and things like that, then we're gonna probably want a little bit more power and go with the M1 Pro. So here's my sequence for this one is going to be for the Intel two is going to be for M1 and three is going to be the grade I'll give for the M1 Pro. Now so far for DevOps, I focused entirely way too much on Docker. Okay, DevOps is not only Docker. There's a ton of things that DevOps do and a lot of the tools that they use might not even be Docker related. Tools like Prometheus, Dynatrace, App Dynamics, uh, CI, CD, like I mentioned before, automation tools. And many of these tools are actually SaaS products or hosted in the cloud or on-prem somewhere, but not on your machine. So guess what? In that case, I'm gonna narrow this down to even more here. I'm gonna narrow this down to just the M1, okay? And I'm gonna leave it there because Docker is just one snapshot of the equation. I'm glad we talked about that, but I'm gonna leave this here for the rest of the DevOps. Let's talk about the next thing on the list, which is security engineer. So far I've done all these jobs. Anyway, maybe that's why they're on the list because I've done these things before. A security engineer is a software engineer who specializes in creating systems and methods and procedures to test the security of a software system and also do a little bit of hacking. I mean, uh, ethical hacking and uh, <laughs> exploiting and fixing security flaws, things like that. Security developer often works as a white hat ethical hacker and attempts to penetrate systems to discover vulnerabilities. And here we're going to have a mixed bag of different tools. There is a lot of really old tried and true tools that security engineers have been using for many, many years. And some of them uh, work with Apple Silicon and some of them don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Wireshark is a big one. Wireshark is Apple Silicon ready. It works on Apple Silicon. Nmap works on Apple Silicon. So does NCAT. The burp suite works with Rosetta. So it works, but through the translation layer, but you don't really need that to be super performant. Then there's things like Nikto that does not have Apple Silicon support. And uh, Kali Linux is a popular tool. That's after my time, way after my time in the security field. So you can run Kali Linux via Parallels. Parallels allows you to run Windows and Linux machines on top of Apple Silicon, and it works very well. There's there's a link down below for a trial if you want to check that out. So let's move security over here. Of course, I'm going to leave this on Intel because a lot of tools, even things that I didn't mention, probably 
my guess still don't run on Apple Silicon very well. And security is such a diverse field that uh, maybe you're going to be focused on database security, right? So you're going to need to cover some of those databases that we've talked about earlier that don't work on Apple Silicon. So I'm going to leave that partially on Intel and partially on M1. I don't think you need to go with the M1 Pro unless you are also testing, for example, mobile applications in development. But I think this is good enough right here. All right, we're moving on to game developers. Now, this is something I've never done before. In fact, all the roles that are left, I've never done before. So if I screw something up, you can leave me a nasty comment down below, but please don't, be nice. <laughs> Game developers, all right? So what are these folks gonna be using? Visual Studio is a popular choice. Unity, Unreal, Blender, and uh, if you're really hardcore, C++. So game developers are gonna require a lot of power, and for those that use Visual Studio are gonna be stuck on Intel-based machines. Now, if you're gonna be doing some light game development and you don't need Visual Studio, you can go with an M1 machine. I've tested Unity before on this channel. I haven't tested Unreal Engine on this channel, but uh, there are a couple of folks who have. Check out their YouTube channels. Unity works pretty well, as we've seen uh, on M1, but it works much better on M1 Pro and M1 Max, as we've seen here. So I'm gonna cover those two as well. And I haven't done this test, but I've seen recent tests on Blender. And this is a package that will take full advantage of the GPUs available on the SOCs, the M1 Max and the M1 Pro. So here I'm gonna expand game development to cover the entire range because you will get benefits out of that. Now, of course, an Intel machine is still an option because then you might have uh, an NVIDIA card that you could throw in there. And uh, there you go, there's Blender, Blender is handled. All right, the next two we're gonna do together, data engineer and data science and ML engineer, machine learning. Now data engineer is someone who develops and constructs and tests and maintains the data architectures, such as databases and large scale processing systems. The data scientist on the other hand, is someone who cleans and massages and organizes big data. Data engineers need to ensure that the architecture that is in place supports the requirements of the data scientists and stakeholders in the business. And lastly, to deliver the data to the data science team, the data engineering team will need to develop data set processes for modeling and mining and production. They're gonna be using tools like SAP and Oracle, Cassandra, MySQL, Redis, Postgres SQL, all the databases, MongoDB, and so on. So because of those databases, I'm gonna have to kind of uh, anchor this down to Intel. Now, a lot of these tools will also work on the M1 MacBook Air. So I'm gonna also expand it to that. But I really don't think that you're gonna need anything more than that for data engineering because all these pipelines you're gonna set up can be handled on lower end machines. Now, if you're doing data science and then machine learning, then you're gonna need some more power. Data scientists will usually already get massage data that's past the first round of cleaning and manipulation, which they can also use to feed sophisticated analytics programs and machine learning and statistical methods to prepare data for use in predictive and prescriptive modeling. Of course, to build models, they need to research uh, the industry and business questions, and they'll need to leverage large volumes of data from internal and external sources to answer business needs. They're gonna need to search the data to find patterns and do magic potion science on them. Really, um, I'll be honest with you, I don't know much about data science or machine learning. I'm getting my feet wet with machine learning, but the channel to really check out specifically about Apple Silicon and how it relates to data engineering, data science is Luke Barus's channel. So check that out. I'll link to it down below. He's got some fun videos too. All right, what tools are these folks using? They're gonna be using things like um, SPSS, R, Python, Julia, Tableau, MATLAB, and even Excel. So because this is a kind of an extension to data engineering and taking it a step further, some of the tools might be shared with data engineering and therefore I'm gonna cover Intel with that and M1. But the extra ML requirement here is gonna be taking us all the way up to M1 Max here. That's because the M1 Max will have that extra memory bandwidth and 32 GPU cores, which are gonna be very handy for ML. And I've done a couple of ML related tests on this channel, so check those out, specifically for uh, the M1 Max as it relates to the other types of Apple Silicon machines. And it does have a little bit of an advantage, but just very minor. Just like game development, if you get a PC with an NVIDIA card and you need that processing power of the GPUs, that might actually run you less money than getting a maxed out M1 Max machine. If I were to rank these, I would say 
one for Intel, two, we're gonna go right down the line here, three, and then four. All right, and finally, we've got a 10X engineer. If you're a 10X developer, then you don't need any of these machines. Just use the force and build your software in your mind. Am I allowed to say that? Is Disney gonna come after me? Disney doesn't give a crap about me. So if you need a machine for your current workload and it's one of the ones I've described, you can still jump to a higher level machine if you plan on expanding your workload in the future. But you really don't need to right now. All right, folks, hopefully you found some value in this video. If you wanna see more videos like this one, subscribe to the channel and I'd appreciate a like and thanks for coming. I'll see you next time.